Let's just pray, shall we, as we open up God's word. Heavenly Father, please, we pray, uh, would you grant to us your interpretation of the scriptures, your truth, your application. And we pray that you would send the living spirit of God who knows the mind of the Father to instruct us in the ways of our Lord Jesus Christ. We come and we sit at your feet and we ask and pray that above all we would see the Lord Jesus himself above all things. Please hear us, Father. Please answer, for we pray this in his precious name. Amen. Well, um, I think most of you would be familiar with the name of Martin Luther, and I'm not here to preach about Martin Luther tonight. Many of you will probably be glad about that. Okay, it's not a sermon on him. But we all know that Luther, along with many other characters throughout the last 2,000 years in church history, but also the church history of the Old Testament, of course the church was called Israel then, wasn't it? Uh, the princes with God. And now the Israel of God is Jew and Gentile together. Praise God for that. A people from every tribe and tongue and nation. But we so often are tempted, aren't we, as Christians, to focus on these, what we call, great heroes of the faith. And don't get me wrong, the scriptures themselves tell us to mark out the blameless man. Not the perfect man. When it says blameless, it's not speaking of someone who's spotlessly clean in their lives. There's only one who's like that, and he's the ultimate one that we follow. As Remember the Apostle Paul said, he said, uh, follow me as I follow Christ. Don't follow me just with everything I do, but if I follow Christ, you follow me. But we're told to look at great men and great women. We're told to, to copy their Christ-likeness. We're told to put into practice the, the way that they speak, the way that they acted, if it is like the Lord Jesus. But there is a temptation to forget that even the great heroes of the faith, in the end, are just little servants of God. They are little servants of God. And we shouldn't despise those who in the scriptures and those who in church history or in our church life today appear to just be the little servants of God. I've no doubt if I was to ask all of you right now, if you're a Christian, tell me, can you, can you tell me one Christian alive today or someone who's gone up to glory who for you, they weren't, they weren't a preacher, they weren't an elder or a deacon, they weren't one of the movers and shakers amongst the ladies of the church, they were just a small, humble, little servant of God. I bet all of you could point one out. And when you think of them, if they are true little servants of God, your heart's warmed on every memory of them. Well, Obadiah is a little servant of God. Now, in one sense, in his, in his day, and with his role and responsibility, he was quite a figure in the nation of Israel. He's the chief steward to the king. His name would have been known in the city of Samaria almost as much as Ahab's would have done. But in the grand scheme of things, Obadiah is a little character in the scriptures, isn't he? He's a little man. There's not much that we know about him. In fact, there's very little that we know about him. And yet the Lord decides to shine a little light on this man. His name, Obadiah, is literally interpreted servant of God. That's what his name means. And Obadiah was a very popular name for a Jewish father to give to his son. There are lots of Obadiahs in the Bible. The obvious one, I'm sure that most of you will think about, is the prophet Obadiah. Well, they're not the same men. David had a mighty man who was called Obadiah. One of the chiefs of the tribes was called Obadiah. One of the doorkeepers, one of the Levites who was a doorkeeper in the temple was called Obadiah. It was one of those names like, I was about to say like my name today, but not so much today, but Peter, a generation ago, in fact if you come to the fraternal that I'm a part of, there's Peters everywhere, you can't escape the name, all right? Obadiah was like that. But isn't it wonderful to have a man who lives up to his name, 
Because it's very easy for us to come and we can speculate. Some Christians would sit there on one side of the jury and say, how on earth could Obadiah be a true man of God and yet be the chief steward of Ahab? How is that possible? How could he, how could he operate with integrity when he's working for such a wicked man? Some people would sit on the other end, uh, the other side of the jury. But you know what? We don't need to speculate, do we? Because God tells us what he thinks about this man. It doesn't really matter what you think, and it doesn't really matter what I think. What does the Bible tell us? Well, if you have your Bibles open at 1 Kings 18, as we had this morning, we read in verse 3, Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. There we are. There's God's judgment. This is what God is saying about this man. He didn't need to say this about Obadiah, did he? He could have even given us the parenthesis of what Obadiah had done when Jezebel had been massacring God's prophets. And just before I say anything else, before we're tempted to think that such days are long gone where God's people are suffering such violence, I think we're all aware, aren't we, that around the world today, most of the church of Jesus Christ suffers violence like this, don't they? Northern Nigeria just in the past few days. And northern Nigeria full stop in the last few years. Churches burned, people killed, kidnapped. And all around the world this is happening to God's people. But God looks at this man and to those who are going to read decades, centuries, millennia later, he wants us to know something. This Obadiah, he is my servant, and he feared me. That's what the Lord wants for us to have remaining in us. And you know, Obadiah was not the only godly man who served wicked rulers. In Jeremiah, we have this man called Ebed or Ebed-Melech. Uh, he was a eunuch. Uh, he was a man who his whole life had been given over to the service of the king of Judah. Zedekiah was the king at the time. Ebed-Melech was a, a foreigner. He was a Gentile. He wasn't even a Jew. And yet he was a God-fearing man. To the point where he's the one who instigates the rescuing of Jeremiah from the well, from the pit that he's been thrown down into. Would you look at Ebed-Melech and say, well, how could he be a man of integrity? And to think for him, he couldn't enter into the, into the temple. He wasn't allowed close to God because he was a eunuch. And yet he was a man who feared God. And don't listen to the church today. It's the church saying, if we don't let people be who they want to be, if we don't follow the gender identity flow and all of this, then, then how are people ever going to draw near to God? It's a load of rubbish. Because when the heart fears God, when the heart wants to draw near to God, it will come. And God will receive it. And that's the lovely thing about the, that you see in the prophecy of Isaiah where it speaks that those eunuchs and those others who were outcasts, those who couldn't come near in Christ, they can come right up to the edge of the throne and touch the scepter of the king and be received. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that wonderful? And really, tonight, I, I just want to say three things about this man and then finish looking at the Lord Jesus. Firstly, I want us to, to remember that he feared the Lord. He feared the Lord greatly. What does it mean to fear? Well, I think it wouldn't be a shock to you that it's not saying that Obadiah woke up every day and his fingers were trembling and, you know, he couldn't lift his eyes up to heaven. There was this sense of, you know, who, who am I before God? Now, there was that. But it wasn't a fear like people outside of this church, people in a Nudigate Road think of as fear. The fear of the dark or the fear of ghosts or the fear of spiders. Something that, that takes away your peace. No, the fear of the Lord is a good thing. It's the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge. The fear of God is the first rung onto the ladder up to true wisdom. And where does the fear of God finish? It doesn't finish with fear. It finishes with love. Because John writes to Christians and he says, perfect love 
has cast out faith. It's not that we as Christians get to a point in our theology or in our experience of God that suddenly we, we've risen so high that we look at God face to face and we say, you're just like me, like the Pharisee in the parable. Do you remember as Jesus spoke about the two men in the temple? It's not saying that we lose any sense of the awesomeness and the majesty of God. In fact, the more that the love of God is manifested in, in our hearts, the more we see his awesomeness. The more his majesty shines through because you say, how can this God love me? How can this one who even the angels say is holy, 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 who have to hide their faces and these are sinless, created spiritual beings in the presence of God. And as they hide their faces, how is it possible that this sinner with unclean lips who lives in a world of sinners can draw near to this God and know that he loves me and he has always loved me with an everlasting love and it was love that he drew me to him with and it's love that fills my heart and gives me joy no, no, the Christian isn't someone who gets higher and higher in their knowledge of God and the fear disappears. No, the fear becomes more acute. It's a trembling thing. It's a, it's, it's a feeling within the soul that makes you want almost like a magnet to draw near into the presence of this God, yet knowing that he is not a tame lion. He is not a tame creature. He is not a, a little, mere man. He's not a superstar footballer. He's not a politician. He is the God who speaks. And the cedars of Lebanon skip. It's the God who speaks and the deer gives birth. It's the God who thunders, like we read in Psalm 29. And yet he's the God who draws near to the humble heart in a still, small voice. Obadiah, his heart was right before God. And what, what a contrast to Ahab. Ahab, a man who fears his wife. Ahab, a man who fears the people. Ahab, a man who, in his folly and in his flesh, he forsakes God and he pursues idolatry. Obadiah is in stark contrast, isn't he? He really, he really sort of stands above, doesn't he? You know, it's amazing. Uh, we've spoken about Luther, uh, not to mention him again, but one of his favorite scriptures was Psalm 130. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? Can I ask you a question tonight, men and women, brothers and sisters, if, if you are? If the Lord should mark your sins, how on earth can you stand before him? What right do you have to have walked into this church named in his name and sit on pews to sing praises in his name? What right, what gall do we have to come before this God in our sin? if God should mark our iniquities and hold them against us. But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. There is forgiveness with God. This God is a God who abounds in mercy. He is slow to anger, as Psalm 103 tells us. And the man who wrote that psalm knows all about the slowness of God to anger. Because David, when he had murdered Uriah, and when he had slept with Bathsheba, and when he had brought, uh, when he, he'd brought misery upon his nation, when he's stubbornly refusing to repent of his sin, who is long-suffering? Who is patient? Who is slow to anger? It's the Lord. And then Nathan the prophet comes. You're the man, David. Does David run and hide from God? How can I ever be forgiven? No. David writes Psalm 51. 
Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and I've done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just in your judgments. But Lord, have mercy on me according to your loving kindness, and according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. David is either an arrogant jerk, or he knows who God is. And it's the latter that's right, isn't it? He knows who God is. He is a God of mercy. He's the God who takes Manasseh, that wicked, evil heart, who shed the blood of his own people so much that God says he made the blood to flow through the streets of Jerusalem. Manasseh, who was an ancient Putin, or Adolf Hitler. Even Christians today would say, how could God ever forgive Putin? How could he ever forgive Adolf Hitler? How could he ever forgive Myra Hindley? How could he ever forgive the paedophile who's abused so many in his life? How could God ever, ever forgive? Well, here's the answer. Because he's God. And not me. Because he abounds in mercy. Because he is a God ready to forgive. And we've all sang the hymn, haven't we? The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. But do you believe that? Do you believe that the vilest of the vile whose heart is touched by the convicting power of God and they're broken before him, can they be forgiven? Do you believe they can be forgiven? I do. And they are. Obadiah feared the Lord. And notice that the fear of the Lord didn't make him an obstinate man. There's nothing worse than an obstinate Christian. If you're a difficult person, deal with it and pray for the Holy Spirit to soften your character and to mellow you. Have grace on your lips, we're told. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, goodness, long-suffering, self-control. We don't read that Obadiah was a great chief steward, but he was a man that Ahab trusted. The fear of the Lord will make a person trustworthy. Are you trustworthy in your job? Are you trustworthy in your relationships? If you're a married person, does your spouse absolutely trust you because you fear God? Obadiah didn't just fear the Lord. He feared him greatly. That's what it says here. It means vehemently, wholeheartedly, especially. What drove Obadiah was his fear and reverence of God. What made him behave the way he behaved, what made him do what he did, was that he feared the Lord greatly. Can I ask you, do you fear the Lord greatly today? Are you a devoted follower of Jesus? Are you devout in your faith? Are you ashamed of the Lord out there in the world? Or do you fear the Lord greatly? And children, just to encourage you, Obadiah says to Elijah, he says to him, I have feared the Lord from my youth. Now, I don't think any of you are maybe over 12 years old. Any 12-year-olds here tonight? No? Any 11-year-olds? Okay, we've got a couple of 11-year-olds. You know, you can fear and follow the Lord Jesus now. Obadiah could say to Elijah, from being a young person I feared God. I took God seriously as my creator when I was a child. And you know, it's a wonderful thing to see a young heart filled with the love of Christ. And to be filled with the fear and the knowledge of God. And to know that young life, God will turn the world upside down through. Because they feared him from their youth. Look at Samuel. Little Samuel as he's there in the tabernacle. Speak Lord for your servant is listening. And above all think of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus is a 12 year old. Who's sitting with the great teachers of the law in Jerusalem. And they are astonished at his learning. Can I tell you. He didn't have that learning by some miraculous power of God. Although, I, of course, we know the Spirit of God was upon him. He did it because as a servant of the Lord, he hungered for God's Word. He read his Bible. Jesus read his Bible. 
And Jesus listened to his father every day he woke up. Isaiah says his ear was listening to what his father was telling him to do. And kids, you do the same. Fear God from your youth. And those who fear God, here's the second thing we see with Obadiah, will be faithful in fear. They will be faithful when they're afraid. Uh, There was a great quote by Elizabeth Elliot. And she said this, there are some times where God doesn't remove our fear and you have to do his will afraid. And you know, I was so glad to read that because I thought every time I go into the open air, I'm afraid. Uh, Every time uh, there's a one-on-one conversation and I feel a little bit out of my depths, I feel afraid. The Lord doesn't promise that in this life, as we follow him, that he will remove us from everything that will cause us to fear. But those who fear God will be faithful even when they're afraid. I, could you imagine just try and enter into the Obadiah's mind when Jezebel is now starting to gather the prophets and to slaughter them wholesale? Can you imagine if that was happening in Bedworth today? All the pastors are being gathered together. Jason's been arrested and Michelle. And they're being shot outside the church. And you know that for you to step out and to risk your life and to hide them and then to feed them and to water them It could cost you everything. Not just your job. It could cost you your life. What Obadiah does in the step that he takes, and notice he didn't just save one or two prophets. I mean, it's not easy to hide 50 guys in a cave, is it? I don't know about you, but the idea of taking 100 men and hiding 50 of them in one place and 50 in another... And all of the logistics that would have gone into feeding them every day and watering them. This is a terrifying prospect. Risk, scale, cost. What this would have cost Obadiah purely out of his pocket. And yet, because he feared God, he was faithful to do what he knew he needed to do. I remember uh, it was years and years ago now as a teenager, was the last time we saw it. Sometimes with our midweek Bible studies, we'd watch sort of Christian movies. And if you've ever seen 70s or 80s Christian films, let's just say they, they, they come with a certain style and a lack of quality quite often. But the message is always really good. And there was this one called Nikolai. Now, you children can probably recognize Nikolai is not an English name. We'd say Nicholas. Nikolai was a Russian boy in the days where the Soviet Union were in charge. His father was a pastor. And his father was arrested. And the story is told how Nikolai, as a teenage boy, who'd been treated badly at school, he didn't have opportunities because he wouldn't join the, the clubs that the communists wanted him to join, he risked taking Bibles hidden to get them to other Christians. As a boy, he was doing it. Was he afraid? Yes. Was he terrified that if he was caught, what would happen to him? Yes. But did he do it? Yes. Because he feared God. And because he knew that Christians needed God's word. And you know, throughout the last 2,000 years, how many have been faithful in fear so that they could get the word of God out to people? When you think of, of, of men like William Tyndale, He had to run away. He was a great mind. He had the world at his feet. A brilliant linguist. Great understanding. But he's converted. And he knows that we need the Bible in English. So what's he going to do? I'm going to translate it. And his life is forfeit. And we could go from one example to another, couldn't we? Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the Old Testament. They stand before the power of the earth. Before Nebuchadnezzar. And they say, we will not bow down to this statue. They are faithful. And does the scripture tell us that God delivered Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego from from fear before he delivered them in the furnace? Does it appear to us that as they stood there before Nebuchadnezzar, they were nonchalant about it? I don't know about you, but if there was a threat of a furnace and I was going to be thrown into it, humanly I'd be terrified. 
But the Christian does not walk by fear. We walk by faith. And if in your Christian life you operate according to what you're comfortable with, you're doing it wrong. (laughs) Do what the Word of God tells you. Do what you know the Spirit of God is encouraging you to do in the work of the church, in the work of evangelism. The UK will never turn back to the Lord Jesus Christ until they hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the devil that makes us afraid to share him. And we've got to overcome that fear. We've got to be faithful in fear. And then leading on from that, and uh, I don't normally use alliteration, but it works here tonight. He feared the Lord. He was faithful in fear for such a time as this. For such a time as this. The prophets are being massacred. Obadiah could very easily have looked over his shoulder. He could have said, well, where's Elijah in all of this? God has stopped the rain. I understand that. I fear God. This is terrible what's happening. But who's going to stand up? Who's going to do the job? You, Obadiah. You're going to do the job. You, Obadiah, you're in the position of influence. You're in the spot where you have the ability to hide these prophets. And I've given you the motivation in your heart to do it. And you think of Queen Esther in the story of Esther, when Mordecai tells her of the terrible news of the decree of the king, that all of the Jews on on a set day are going to be wiped out. And Mordecai says to Esther, you've got to go to the king. And I can understand her fear. Esther knows, number one, she hasn't been called by the king for weeks now. And number two, for her to enter into the presence of the king of Persia, and he hasn't welcomed her, her life is over. She will die that day. She knows the gravity of this. And she says to Mordecai, how on earth can I, I can't go in. And Mordecai says, listen Esther, if you don't, God will raise up another to do it. Could it be that you are in this position for such a time as this? Now do we then read that Esther says, okay then Mordecai, right, I'm going to go right now. No, she depends upon God, doesn't she? Three days of fasting and praying. Mordecai, you fast. Get all the Jews to fast. I and my handmaids, we're going to fast and we're going to pray. We're going to seek God on this because I cannot go into this throne room on my own. But I will go. And she goes in. And you read that wonderful scripture that the king held out the scepter to her. For such a time as this, You and I, brothers and sisters, in the Lord Jesus, we can't look back at Elijah and Obadiah today. We can't can't look at even the great men who established this church, I don't know, maybe a couple of centuries ago, when the gospel came to Bedworth and people were converted. They've gone to be with the Lord. They're not alive. They're not in the world. But you are. And I am. And we are here for such a generation as this. We are here in in Bedworth for you for such a day as this. You are here on Newdigate Road for such a community as this. And all of us are called to be an Obadiah. A little servant of God. To do the little things that God has called us to do. And even when we, by his help and strength, as Psalm 19 said, the Lord will strengthen his people. He will give his people peace. All we can say at the end of our lives is, Lord, I've been an unprofitable servant. I have done what you asked me to do. Do you know what the Lord requires of us? That we do his will that we love his mercy, that we walk humbly with him, and that we don't seek a great name for ourselves. Who cares about being a great preacher? Who cares about being a church officer? 
Who cares about being a mover and shaker in the church? Who cares? Who cares about having a name in the world? Who cares? What does it matter in the long run? I look at Obadiah and there is a little servant who had a great God and he was faithful in the day in which he lived. And that is what the Lord Jesus requires of you and me. He's not asking us to do awesome things. (laughs) He's asking us to do his will and to obey him and to be his little servants. And he has not left us without an example because the Son of Man came into this world, didn't he? Obadiah is not our great example. Elijah is not our great example. It's our Lord Jesus who Paul says in 2 Philippians, sorry, Philippians 2, he says, though he didn't see it as robbery to be equal with God, yet he humbled himself and he became like a man. He took on flesh like sinful men. The God of heaven took on flesh. He humbled himself. I don't care what the great men and women of this world think they've done. Compared to that, it's nothing. And then he became a slave. And he went even lower. He gave himself to death. And then he went even lower than that. He gave himself to the death of the cross. He was cursed by God. The Lord Jesus, who began at the height of heaven, came down lower than you and I have ever and ever will go. He became the filth and the smut of this world. Because he came to be the true servant of God. He came to show us what it means to follow God. But where did God leave him? Did he leave him in the filth and the dirt of the cross? No, he didn't. He lifted him up, didn't he? And he gave Jesus the name that's above every name. Yours are my names. They're irrelevant unless they're eternal in God's mind and God's heart. But compared to Christ, What does it matter if England win the World Cup? And I love rugby. What does it matter if so-and-so becomes the next Prime Minister? Or if King Charles has a long reign? What does it matter if you're popular in the town of Bedworth? It's all irrelevant. If you haven't followed the servant king who went so low, but God is highly exalted. And where is he now? He is at the right hand of the throne on high. That's the throne we need to focus on. That's the throne that we need to long for. That's the place we want to be. And we have a saviour who has gone before us. And he said to his disciples, he said, the son of man didn't come into this world so that we could serve him. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that awesome? How we would find it amazing if some dignitary that we hold in high regard was to come to us and say, I, I just I want you to, to come and I want to spend time with you. We, we, we'd, we'd all be ready to show them respect and care and I want to serve you, I want to do something for you. But here the Lord Jesus doffs his outer garment and he wraps a towel around himself and he washes his disciples' feet. And he says, as I have done, so you do for one another. He who will be greatest among you must be the servant of all. And he showed us how it's done. And the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You can't atone for the sins of the people of Bedworth. You can't do that. Christ is the only one but you can lay down your life as a servant of God to do everything within your power to bring them to Christ. And you can lay down your life for one another in this church and serve one another like Christ did, where you say, it's not my will, it's not my opinions, it's not my achievements, it's not my ego, and it's not my name. I will take the worst place, I will take the worst jobs, I will... Love the worst people with real love. And I will serve like my Saviour served. Because that is the desire of every follower of Jesus Christ.
And if you don't know this Jesus Christ tonight, I, I don't know how much more I can say or what I can say to commend him to you. The one who came to serve you in your sin and to bring you back to God so that you could be a child of God. Let's just pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we, we know that there is so much more that can be said. But Father, the message, I pray, is clear. Help us, Lord, to see in Obadiah our Saviour. And help us, Lord, to have grace so that we fear you, so that we love you, so that we are faithful in obedience to you. Help us, Lord, practically within the church and help us, Lord, in these days to come out there in the world to be faithful servants, even when we're afraid. Father, forgive us for when we have disobeyed, when we have failed you. And thank you, Lord Jesus, that you tell us that we are no longer your servants, but that you have made us your friends. We are friends with God. What can the world give us that's better than that? Thank you, Father. Amen. Let's sing then our closing hymn of, of our worship today. From heaven you came, helpless babe. Entered our world, your glory veiled. Not to be served, but to serve. And give your life that we might live. Thank you.